So this is a, a, a new data set for Buddhist transcriptional Chinese. Uh, so this is, um, uh, comes from a project, and the project was called uh, Han Phonology when Chinese became Chinese. And it's uh, a project uh, run at SOAS University of London, uh, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and the PI is uh, uh, Dr. Ernest Caldwell. So the project is about how Chinese was pronounced during the Han Dynasty. It has various components, and we will only be talking about the use of Buddhist evidence. Making some methodological remarks, I think we have two kinds of historical phonology. One is comparative, where we where we uh, reconstruct uh, unattested languages by comparing related languages. And the other one is what I'm calling philological historical phonology, the interpretation of ancient documents, the phonological interpretation of ancient documents. And then I make this a little bit more precise, which I think there's no point in reading out, but uh, the linguist in me wanted to make this a little bit more precise. When we do comparative linguistics, we have two tools. One is exceptional sound change, and the other one is analogy. For those of you who, who aren't so interested in historical linguistics, never mind. It's just how I think, because it's mostly what I do. Uh, but then for philological historical phonology, I think we also have two methods. There's less discussion of, of this uh, explicitly in, in methodological terms, so I'm a little bit punting here, but this is how I am thinking of it for our project. So we want to figure out how Chinese was pronounced, and that's what my capital C is. And I think we have two methods. One I'm calling imposition, where we know something, how it's pronounced, and we're somehow imposing that phonetic interpretation on the Chinese characters from the outside of the system. And then we have a transposition, where we have an existing interpretation of some part of Chinese, and we are kind of moving that interpretation to some other part of Chinese. So if you like, we get some interpretation on part of the data, and then we can move that inter interpretation around inside uh, the object we're studying. So just to give some examples, because this was quite abstract, imposers, uh, we can use loans in and out of Chinese. So for instance, the word uh, chariot, it doesn't come directly from Sanskrit, but maybe Indo-Aryan. We can identify uh, the word chariot that we know the pronunciation of and the Chinese word uh, for chariot and refine the pronunciation in this way. And similarly, the word for tiger, uh, which comes from Southeast Asia. So I'm doing one you know, Western borrowing and one sort of Southeastern borrowing. Uh, and then the thing you know that this talk is about is the transcription of Indic terms. So we have Varanasi and uh, Akantishta. These words allow us to identify, you know, how these Chinese uh, characters were pronounced. Yeah, uh, and then uh, just to fill in the methodology uh, for examples of transposition, we have things like paronomastic glosses. So uh, this commentator says, read this character as this character. So in this way, we have a reason to think these two characters were pronounced similarly. And then there's actually, of course, explicit uh, linguistic annotation, like we have these chains of uh, Fanchia spellers, where we look up Lu, and it says, this is the initial, this is the final, we look up this one, and it says, this is the initial. So then we can identify this whole series of characters has the same initials, right? So, so the whole point of everything I've said so far is just these two moves of imposition of phonetic information from the outside and then uh, transposition of phonetic information among different Chinese characters within the, the system. And if you like, our project is just trying to make these two moves with all of the available data in the Han Dynasty in particular. Now on to the data set and maybe this is where I switch to let uh, Julian take over. Thank you. Um, right, so as we're collecting data from Buddhist texts, there's this uh, classic book from 1983 uh, by South Koblin uh, that collects all the sound glosses from the Eastern Han, not just the Buddhist one, but uh, today we only focus on the, on the Buddhist one. Uh, this contains uh, glosses and transcriptional data from uh, three people. So, uh, An Shigao, famous translator of Chinese texts from Central Asia, 
uh, Lo Kakshema, whose name is reconstructed, we only know his uh, Chinese name, uh, with uh, Yue Zhi and uh, Kang Mengxiang, we, we don't know very much uh, of him, but we think he's Sopian. Right, so this is what is contained in Koblin, and we try to update these with more data. So we've added uh, new text for An Shikao. So the literature has proven that more texts uh, that were not listed so far in his corpus should be ascribed to him or to his uh, translated team, let's say. Uh, and uh, there are also texts uh, that come from uh, a discovery of manuscripts in a Japanese uh, Kongoji uh, temple uh, that have also been uh, proven to belong to uh, and Shukau's translations. For Lokakshema, we added more words from the text that were covered by Koblin, but that Koblin had missed. Uh, there are no new texts uh, that we have added yet, but we know that there are other manuscripts that we need to go through and try to retrieve a uh, transcription for. And Kang Mung Sung, we didn't add anything yet, and I'm not aware that there are other texts that have been ascribed to him. So that might be uh, just the state of things for uh, Kang Mung Sung. Since uh, the literature tells us that it is possible that the source language of the translations uh, by An Shigao and Lokakshima is Gandhari. Uh, we're adding uh, the Gandhari equivalent to the words uh, that we have in Chinese. These words have usually been identified as matching some Sanskrit or Pali words, and so we are making the work of adding either attested or unattested, uh, so positive. Uh, Gandhari words. And finally, we're adding transcriptions into uh, different stages of Chinese so that we're able to compare the Gandhari, Sanskrit, and Pali to what the Chinese characters would have been pronounced like according to Schussler's uh, reconstruction. Right, so we added some text. Uh, this is the long list. This is the text that I've been talking about that we had for An Shigao. These texts uh, are the first ones all in the they were just not ascribed uh, beforehand to An Shigao, and now stylistic and, li and linguistic evidence has conclusively proven that they are likely to be from either An Shigao or his team. And we've removed uh, one text that was uh, ascribed to him, but now we think that this is a commentary, so the Da An Ban Shou Yixing is a commentary on the previous slide, so uh, somewhere around here, there's the Anban thing, I think. Uh, yes, so in the Congo, see the text that the Ta Anban thing is a commentary on was found, and so it has now been concluded that this is a later text and not from An Shigao. So this has been removed from our data set. This is our data set so far, but it's still evolving. The biggest change is that uh, adding the Congo, uh, mainly taken from uh, the dictionary of uh, Dr. Vetter, uh, we are more than doubling the number of uh, transcription uh, words that we get from An Shigao, and uh, we're using Dr. Hill and Natier uh, and others uh, look at Shema's data, which contains those transcription words that were not covered by uh, Koblin. And for Kang Mung as I said, nothing new. All right, so maybe some observations on what we can see at this stage uh, where we haven't really finished uh, the data set, but we can already see some things. So if we look at the Anshigar text, um, we see that for instance, sibilants match Gandhari better than Sanskrit and Pali. So every time we have a, a palatal uh, sh, uh, this is written uh, in Chinese with a sh, so we have like Shakamu for Shakyamuni, and we have Shaliput for Shaliputra uh, in Gandhari, so it's much it's there. And for the retroflex, flex, we have characters that contain retroflex flex pronunciation rather than the palatal. So in three of the examples, Gandhari and Sanskrit would be equivalent matches against Pali. And then in the Shramana, then uh, here we have um, a retroflex flex on the Gandhari and on the Chinese. So that goes with what has been said about An Shigar, that maybe uh, he was using uh, Gandhari text as a source. For Lokakshema, we get a slightly more complicated picture. Uh, so some words match better in Gandhari and some in Pali. So uh, on the first table, we have the word Achanda in Chinese, uh, which is more likely to, make, to meet uh, Pali than Gandhari, which uh, seems to have lost the nasal before the D. 
although in some dialects the the writing the spelling does not actually show the end so it might be that the achada that is written in gandhari here is actually achanda we need to investigate further and in some other cases it's more clearly that uh, the source might have been gandhari so we have this word shanti kanti and uh shanti which is written in chinese as chantie where here the spelling is actually uh, slightly confusing but the ksh actually transcribes the sound ksh um, and so it's a better match for the for the chinese and then we have this word at the end uh, lodala uh, that preserves the the r let's say either of sanskrit or gandhari so these are the initial observations that we have and in some cases uh, for specific phonemes, it seems there's variation. So some words seem to match Pali better, some words match Gandhari better, and we need to analyze better, like which text does it come from, uh, because it is supposed that Lokakshema's uh, translation team would have changed over time, and that it's possible that as he worked with a different team over time, uh, it would have an influence on the choice of transcription into Chinese. So. Uh, in the first table, we have a sound J uh, that in Gandhari became Y. I have a typo there. This Avarajida should be Avarajida for the Gandhari column, uh, where we see that uh, the two first line really uh, are better matched uh, by Pali. So we have the Kwatid that is probably closer to Vajira, and Aparagidae that better matches um, Aparajida rather than Aparagida. Uh, but on the last line, however, we have Laya that better matches Raya than the Raja or the other ones. And the second table, we have this uh, P and B that became labial approximant in Gandhari, so were, for which we see the first word is again the same example as before, Aparagida, that preserves uh, the Pali and Sanskrit P. Uh, but for the word uh, Dipankara that became Diwangara, then here we have a character that clearly does not contain a P in Chinese, but something like Hua, so might be taken to be uh, the labial approximant. Oh, and also note that here we're using Schuster's later hand um, reconstruction that has all of these I, I, I everywhere, but uh, it seems that at least the choice of character here uh, suggests that this yod had fallen by the time of the translations by Lokak Shema and Anshukau. So it should not be Apailaigidai, but Apalagida. And that is kind of where we are at the moment. There are more texts that we would like to include in our data set. Um, there's a text called Suba uh, Nili Ting, so the 18, the, the classic of the 18 hells um, that has been shown by Antonel, Antonello Palembo uh, to be uh, free and Shigao. So I think he shows that it's clearly Western hand, so that would be even earlier and as uh, much closer to uh, old Chinese uh, phonology that we need to integrate. Um, and then we need to do the computational linguistics on top. And that is it. Thank you. Where can I get the data? Uh, we're about to publish an article with the data. Um, but as you might have heard from some of the comments, we're still working on it. Uh, but yeah, we hope to publish this uh, sometime in May. But it's worth noting that an earlier version, if you like, of the data from 2020 is already up on Zenodo. Also, you digitized all of the Fetter, and that's on Zenodo as well. How do you handle the phonetic uncertainty on the Indian side? I'm surprised you're worried about the uncertainty on the Indic side. We know that Sanskrit chakra, okay, it was somehow chakra, right? Yeah, the phonetic details maybe are more insecure, but uh, knowing how the Chinese is pronounced is much more of a problem, right? So, um, like like for Gandhari, we're reading things by stuff and bounds and doing the best we can. Let's take the old Chinese in the first example, so the, or the late Han Chinese in the second example. This represents the current state of the field. I mean, I think it'd be science in general as a kind of spiral process, right? Where like Koblen looked at some things based on 
the understanding in 1983, and that had a certain influence mostly on uh, Chinese. And then there's a lot of other work uh, on Chinese in the intervening, you know, 30 years. And then every once in a while, these fields that have been developing more or less separately, like Chinese historical phonology and Central Asian Buddhist philology, need to get back in touch with each other. There is an element of circularity in this, but I think it's a kind of good circularity because it's not it's not purely uh, circular. Yeah, like in those two equations, like they feed each other. You're using unknowns to solve for other unknowns. That's that's clear, but it's 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 a question of the overall uh, coherence of the system. I think, yeah. Are changes in transliteration practice coming from changes in or of the source language, or changes in Chinese? I mean, I really think we have both. So, so let's take the the, the example that uh, that um, uh, Julia mentioned at the very end. So, uh, using the Chinese terminology, you have what's called the ubu and the gubu. So the u, so originally in old Chinese, these were pronounced uh, u a and i. Yeah, but then at some point in the Han Dynasty, and maybe around the change from Western to Eastern Han, a changes to u and I changes to ah. So then suddenly, like there's like a date, like there's a date where when they hear indic ah, they want to write one set of characters. And then there's a date later where if they hear indic ah, they turn to a whole different set of characters. Yeah, so that's a totally Chinese internal change that's influencing the practice of trans transcribing. Uh, but uh, especially if we want to use, uh, Indic evidence for some of these finer details in uh, Chinese, and I'll just give you an example that I'm very interested in, which is there's a hypothesis that old Chinese had a final R separate from final N and final Y. Uh, it's controversial. The data is mixed. Well, here you can't just if you look at Dharma, yeah, uh, and you think it has an R there, then you will look for how this R is written in. Uh, Chinese, but of course, Dharma didn't have an R there because of the Middle Indic side. So, uh, yeah. So, so, so this is how we're trying to kind of really bring both into into detailed dialogue. Yeah.